All right, let's build some more matrices. So here we have to deal with the first derivative of u, and we want to use um, second order central finite difference. So um, recall that um, the second order central finite difference approximation for the first derivative of u is given by the following formula. You take vi plus 1 and you subtract vi minus 1 over 2hx. This you can find this in like if you read um, Levesque's book on finite difference methods this will come up in like one of the first pages of the book um i don't think it's mentioned in this textbook but this is um when you're looking at finite difference met methods this is a second order finite difference approximation of the first derivative thus we have the following um system of equations so we have epsilon times um our normal approximation of minus u x x which Again, minus vi minus 1, j plus 2, vij minus vi plus 1, j, all over hx squared, plus epsilon, and then we do the same thing, but for um, the, uh, for the y value. So it's 2 vij, and we subtract v i j plus 1 and we divide by h y squared then we have to add in this um this a u x term which is going to look like a times v i plus 1 minus v i minus 1 all over 2 h x and this is going to be equal to the approximation of f at i j and of course we're assuming again that we have v i j equal to zero on the boundary. So v zero j and v n j will be zero for any choices of j and v um, v i zero and v i m will be zero for any choices of i. Um, do I have the n's and the m's correct? I believe I do. Um, I actually didn't check that, but um, make sure that the n's and the m's match whichever variable they associate with. Okay, so now let before we um, before we make our matrices, we're going to find some useful constants. So we'll have two epsilon over h x squared plus. 2 epsilon over hy squared. And note that this is a coefficient of vij in the above formula. Um, and then we have, like we had before, we have beta x is minus epsilon over hx squared. And we similarly have beta y, which is minus epsilon over hy squared. And we have gamma, which is going to be a over 2hx, and this is going to be the coefficients for the vi plus 1 and vi minus 1 that correspond with the um, first derivative approximation. Okay, now that we have all this information, we can go ahead and start to build our matrices, or our matrix. Okay, so we're going to have v11, um, and then we're going to go all the way up to v1, n minus 1. That's going to be the first vector. Second vector is going to be v2, 1, all the way up to v2, n minus 1. We have v3, 1, all the way to v3, n minus 1. Okay, so this means that n is associated with the second index and m is associated with the first index. So, of course, this is going to go on and on and on. Um, and then 
What else are we here? Let me scroll up a little bit more here. This should be good because this way we see like every, all the information that we need. Okay, so now um, again these these things I've written up here. These are just going to help me keep track of the columns and let me know like which column will be associated with which variable when you do the matrix multiplication. Um, so, anyways, matrix is going to go like maybe like here. And then the matrix that we're going to multiply by is we're going to have um, two, three, that should be enough. V11 all the way down to V1 n minus 1. Then we have a break there. V21 all the way down to V2 n minus 1. V31 all the way down to V3 n minus 1. And then this will keep going and going and going. Okay, so let's use this information to make our grid block matrices, our block matrices. Of course, this will be a vector like this. Then once we do these five blocks, we should have enough information to do everything. Okay, so let's look at this first, um, the first row in um, the second row of block matrices that I've written here. So these are going to correspond to F, I, J. Um, this is going to correspond with the equation that is set to be equal to F, I, J. Um, actually, we're looking at this because we're using this row. We're going to start with um, this entry here. So the one corresponding with F21. So we want the equation, we want all the coefficients that will give us the equation that is equal to F21. So we let I equal 2 and J equals 1. And then we just fill in the information. So of course corresponding with V21 we have this coefficient of alpha. And so we put that in here. And then, let's see here, when we're dealing with the Y values, um, Let's see here, we're going to have a V20, which is set to be 0, but then you have V22, and what's going to be the coefficient of that? Well, we've got a minus epsilon over HY squared, so we will do a beta Y, and that will go here because it corresponds to um, the V22 column. Okay, so that's the Ys, and then for the Xs, um, when we look at V11, um, you get a beta X there because of the um, because of the diffusion term with respect to X. But then from the first derivative term, we also get a minus A over 2HX. And so we're going to have to subtract gamma from this entry as well. And then when we look at V31, we get a beta X again, but there's also a... Um, a coefficient of, of positive A over 2HX, and so we're going to add gamma. And then you continue like this, you go down to the second row, everything kind of shifts over by one column. We get an extra beta Y here, because here we're, um, we're looking at um, the, col the row corresponding to F22, so I equals 2 and J equals 2, and so when we go, when we decrease um, the j value by 1 and look at v21, that's actually a coefficient that we have in here. It's not automatically set to 0, and so we put this other beta y in here. And then again on the diagonals, here we have beta x minus gamma and beta x plus gamma. And so if you looked at some of the previous exercises, you might see where this is going, because this actually looks very similar. Um, some of the coefficients are different, but the structure is largely the same. We'll have beta y alpha, beta y, then beta y alpha. And then these beta y's will be connected by dots, and these alphas will be connected. So this is going to be a tridiagonal matrix block in the middle here. And then, okay, so that, that finishes up this second row of in the block matrix structure. Looking at the first row in the block matrix structure, and looking at the first row in those two blocks, um, we again we have the alpha associated with V11, so now we're setting I equal 1 and J equal 1. 
Um, and so associated with V11, we have alpha. Uh, when we're looking at Ys, V10 is set to zero, so that doesn't get included. V12 gives us a beta Y right here. Um, and then when we look at V01, well, V01 isn't on here, so there's nothing corresponding with that. But V21, we do have something, and so we have this beta X plus gamma here again, for the same reasons that we had it here. And then, again, we're just going to fill in the rest of this. It's going to have the same tridiagonal structure here. then alpha, beta y, then we're going to have beta x plus gamma going down the diagonal here as well. Okay. Okay, so this should give us an idea of what the structure is going to look like. We see that this block structure is tridiagonal. Each of the diagonal blocks is just this tridiagonal matrix involving alphas and betas, and it's an n minus 1 by n minus 1 matrix. And then when we look at the upper band of the diagonal in the block structure, we get identity matrix matrices multiplied by beta x plus gamma. And in the lower um, diagonal of this tridiagonal block structure, the blocks are beta x minus gamma entries. Okay, so using this information, we can go ahead and um, build the block matrix, uh, or, or write more rigorously or more clearly, uh, what the system is going to look like. So let vi equal uh, v1i all the way up to v1n minus 1. Transpose. Probably should have written this beforehand just to define these um, row matrices to make it easier to talk about, but it doesn't really matter too much. Um, okay, so we have these, and we're going to define a matrix that we're going to use. It's going to be A, which is alpha, beta y, beta y, alpha, beta y. It's just the tridiagonal matrices that we are using. Beta y, alpha, beta y, finally beta y and an alpha. And this is n minus 1 by n minus 1. Then the system of equations used to describe our method can be written as follows. So we're going to take A and then here. So let me make sure I have enough room. So we have A, we, we're going to have beta x minus gamma times the identity matrix. Then A and then beta x plus gamma times the identity matrix. And again, up here, we're also going to have beta x plus gamma times the identity matrix. And this is going to be the block structure, and it's going to go all the way down. We've got beta x minus gamma i, a beta x plus gamma i. And then on this final row here, we're going to have, we have the a here, and everything on the right sort of falls off. So all we have left is, or doesn't fall off, it falls off in the sense that every all the coefficients are going to be set to zero because they correspond with um, entries that would be on like the very boundary. And we set our boundary values to be zero. But finally we have this beta x minus gamma i here. Um, finally, and so it makes sense because the top row we had a beta x, a beta x plus gamma matrix with no beta x minus y matrix, whereas in the bottom row we have a beta x minus gamma matrix without no beta x minus gamma, without any beta x plus gamma matrix. Okay, 
So we have this, and then this is going to be multiplied by V1, V2, and then all the way down to how many of these do we have? We're going to have Vm minus 2, and then Vm minus 1. And this is going to be set equal to F1, F2, all the way down to Fm minus 2, Fm minus 1. And again, these are each of these Vi's and Fi's, each of these is itself a column vector. And so given that um, we have m minus 1 column vectors here, we can see that the matrix, the dimensions of this matrix in block form is going to be, we're going to have n minus 1 by n minus 1 blocks. Okay? And that finishes this part of the exercise, and I almost forgot that we need to look at the other part. Um, to, um, for this matrix, to be um, diagonally dominant, what that means is that we need AII to always be greater than or equal to sum from J not equal to I of AIJ for every single I. So for every single row I, the magnitude of the term on the diagonal must be greater than the sum of the terms not on the diagonal. And there, there is a little strange thing here that I noticed. Um, in the textbook, they define this as weakly diagonally dominant, and in the problem statement, it says just diagonally dominant. And I looked it up on Wikipedia. At first, I was thinking, okay, maybe diagonally, maybe weakly diagonally, diagonally dominant means that you have a less than or, or you have a greater than or equal to sign here, but if you just say diagonally dominant, then it's a strictly greater than. But then I looked up on Wikipedia, and Wikipedia says that diagonally dominant means you have a greater than or equal to sign. So I'm just going to stick with that. Um, if that ends up not being you, the convention that's typically used, you can always replace this greater than or equal to with just with strictly greater than. But anyways, all of the diagonals of this matrix are the same, and so it's always you're always going to have magnitude of A, because alpha is the only diagonal term, and then we look at the rows, looking at the rows, how many term, like what's the greatest number of different terms that you could have there? Because the more terms you have, these, these are absolute values on the right hand side of this inequality, so the more terms you add in, the bigger your inequality could get. So the worst case scenario would be that you have all of the um, all of the beta x's and you have the beta x minus no you have both of the beta y terms and you have the beta x minus gamma term and the beta x plus gamma term. So you're going to have beta x minus gamma and then you're going to have two of the beta y terms then you're also going to have beta x plus gamma. This is the most stuff you could have in your row outside of the diagonal. Okay, and then we just sort of do some math here. So this is 2 epsilon over hx squared plus 2 epsilon over hy squared. It's greater than or equal to C here. So this is minus epsilon over hx squared minus a over 2hx. And this is going to be plus... 2 epsilon over hy squared. Again, this is positive because we're taking absolute values. Um, and hy is an epsilon. hy and epsilon are assumed to be positive. At least I, I think they want epsilon to be strictly positive. Because that's what we typically do here. Um, yeah, and then I guess I, sh I, I feel like maybe I should check to see that um, ch 
check to see that they want the um, A to be positive. But I don't know if they mention that at all. Um, yeah, just looking at this exercise. Um, yeah, there's no... Okay. I think what they're doing here is uh, typically what you have is... Um, they're, they're sort of a weird thing in these types of problems where like when you get more into like different when you study these more closely sometimes you have scenarios where you when you look at a um, an invection dominated problem where you just have an equation in terms of the first derivative you don't really get uniqueness of solutions you can get a whole bunch of solutions and so you have to think about like okay what would be the correct solution like what would be the best solution what's the solution that we're looking for and one way to find that is you actually add in epsilon you add in the second derivative so instead of looking at like um u prime equals f you add in like epsilon times u double prime plus u prime equals f and maybe i should probably have minuses like here Maybe a minus in front of the U, I'm not quite sure. Um, but yeah, so sometimes in order to get like the ideal solution or the solution that you're looking for, you have to add in this second derivative term here. And what you do is you take this epsilon and you start with like a, an epsilon which is going to be always greater than zero. Epsilon will always be greater than zero. But you choose an epsilon, you find the solution, and then you take the limit as epsilon goes to zero. And in some cases that will, the solution that you get will converge to a particular solution. Um, so in this case, the reason that you add in that epsilon is because once you add in that epsilon, the second equation that I've written here actually does have a unique solution and you can figure out what that solution is using some numerical method. And then um, once you know that that you have a unique solution there, you can send take the limit as epsilon goes to zero, and in some cases the solutions that you get will approach some solution, and it approaches something which is a solution of the first equation. It's not the only solution of the first equation, but it's a solution of the first equation, and it ends up being the the equation that you're looking for because you achieve because you attained this equation in this particular way by um, introducing this epsilon times the second derivative and taking epsilon to zero so I think we're going to be assuming that epsilon is positive in this problem that's what I'm getting at um, because that's how you would use this in practice you would want epsilon to be positive and you might want to take epsilon to be very 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 small but it's going to be positive and so we don't need to worry about absolute values here with A, I don't know about the constant A, so I'm going to assume A could be positive or negative. So I'm going to leave absolute values around it. Okay, but moving on, we have minus epsilon over hx squared plus A over 2hx. And then, okay, so these two cancel. Then we have 2 epsilon over hx squared is greater than or equal to... Well, if we want to, if we want to simplify this, we get... This is... 2 epsilon over hx squared plus ahx over 2hx squared just because I want to get similar denominators and we also get rid of the minus signs because we can do that because everything's in absolute value then we do the same thing over here in getting similar denominators and then what we end up with is 2 epsilon over hx squared greater than or equal to We'll have 2 epsilon plus ahx plus absolute value of ahx minus 2 epsilon. This all divided by 2hx squared. And so you can multiply the denominator on the right hand side over and you end up with 4 epsilon is greater than or equal to absolute value of 2 epsilon plus ahx plus ahx minus 2 epsilon. And so 
let's see here. I think we're going to assume that A is always going to be... Yeah, I don't... I don't know if we need to do anything else here. I'm not exactly sure what sort of condition the problem wants us to arise at, but this is certainly a condition um, which is equivalent to, like if if this condition is sad, this, this condition is sufficient and necessary for the matrix to be diagonally dominant. If this if this is not if this inequality is not true, then you will have rows where um, the terms not on the diagonal will add up to something greater than the term on the diagonal. Um, but if this inequality is satisfied, then the diagonally dominant requirement is satisfied. So this certainly is an answer. This is um, a requirement on A and Epsilon in order to satisfy um, the condition of being diagonally dominant. But I don't know if this is exactly what they wanted us to arrive at. Um, but in any case, uh, here you go. Here's a solution. Um, and so maybe, maybe like if you're putting this in practice and you want a matrix that's diagonally dominant, you might have to like, um, you, you might have to put some restrictions on like, like if you want to send epsilon to zero, you might not be able to do that because of this. Um, actually, yeah, let's look at that because if if a if a is just some constant and you send epsilon to zero, then on the right hand side of this equation you'll just have two times the absolute value of a h x. But on the left hand side you'll have zero, um, and that doesn't hold. So I guess in this scenario you you can't actually send epsilon to zero. So maybe if you want to deal with this problem, you'd have to do something different, or you'd have to find a nice way of dealing with matrices which are not diagonally dominant. Any, in any case, whatever the scenario, this is certainly a necessary and sufficient condition for being diagonally dominant, and so this finishes our um, solution to the exercise.